All right. Oh my goodness, 907. Let's jump. Did your picture sell? Uh it's it's not officially uh on display until a week from Friday. Uh -huh. I delivered it on Monday. Now they're all they're doing the hangings, you know, the, the okay. whole gallery is being rehung. So they're doing okay. the hangings, and then Friday is uh Friday is the opening. Oh, so you'll be there for that, Swami. Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great. That'll be wonderful. <laughs> probably. Oh goodness <laughs> gracious. Yeah. Anyway, you know, I figure you got to get out in the community. Yes. You, you got to, you know, of course, mother will bring people to the front door if she wants to. So we'll see. But it's all kind of, <laughs> it's play, really. <laughs> <coughs> all right. Mistakes in practice. So this is interesting. Okay. Mistakes in practice. Mistakes in practice. Wow. Okay. Oops. Ever since my birthday, I need reading glasses. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> All right. His intro, uh, I guess, what do you call these little blurbs he puts at the front? This frontal blurb. That's what we'll call it. It is when you... It is when your practice is rather greedy that you become discouraged with it. Oh, do you find that to be true? When you become a little greedy in your practice, when you're trying to accomplish too much or trying to, to practice beyond your star, if it's possible, then uh, you get a little discouraged, right? You don't live up to your own standards. There's a lot to be said about that, actually. Uh, I really learned that. When I started out, my teacher, uh, uh, Prabhrajika Moksha Prana, you know, she <laughs> she recognized, you know, that I had one of those back then. I don't know, Mike, I think I've changed categories now, but back then I had a very type A personality. I'd always try and be just a little bit too intense about anything I took over. And it would often lead to failure because I couldn't maintain my intensity. And then I would get discouraged and then I'd feel ashamed and then I'd stop doing whatever I was doing. And so, uh, you know, I tell people when I started my practice, <laughs> of course, the embarrassing thing is it's not much different now, 25 years later, but in the beginning, you know, I practiced for two minutes twice a day. That was it. Uh, because I had one of those conversations with myself that Ramakrishna had with, with uh, Girish, you know, about what, what would I be able to actually do, <laughs> you know? And uh, I knew that my my character would be to jump in and, you know, do an hour the first day. And the next day I'd be like, oh, I can do another half hour. I'll do an hour and a half. And then by the end of the week, I'd be like, yeah, I can do two and a half hours. This is going to be great. And of course, you know, that's not maintainable when you're when you're starting out. And so you get a little bit overzealous and then you start missing them and you start then that avoidance switch gets clicked inside or you don't want to be confronted with those things and sort of little by little your whole practice slides away because you got discouraged because you tried to do too much and um you know practice practice should be very much like going on a date with with the divine <laughs> the practice you know your practice shouldn't be doing homework it's not that's not the spirit it's not it's not going out and doing practice like, you know, something you have to do to get something else. Uh, our, our practice is time with the beloved. It's concentrated, focused time uh, touching the spirit within, you know, however you want to name that or look at that. And it should be it should be a time of, of wonderful peace, a time of, of you know, laughing. If you're if you're not good at meditation, I think the best thing you can do is learn to laugh at your mind, learn to laugh at your failures. Say you know, look at them and shake your head, acknowledge them, hand them to mother, and and just like a child, run off to play. Don't don't become bogged down in these things. Stay inspired. At the end of the day, you're a child of the divine mother. 
And there is always room for a good laugh in that. There's always room for a good smile, for a moment of encouragement. <laughs> you know, shake, sit there and shake your head with her like a little toddler. You know, look at the mess you made and then just sit there with your mother and go, oh, look what that toddler did. <laughs> You know, and then get about moving on, cleaning up and moving on. So it is when your practice is rather greedy that you become discouraged with it. So you should be grateful that you have a sign or a warning signal to show you the weak point in your practice. Yeah. Anytime there's suffering, that's an invitation to inquiry and it includes your practice. If your practice is is dead or dry or uninspiring to you, change your dance step a little bit, you know? Do a waltz for a little while. Change the songs you sing. Make a song up when you sit. Just do something, do something a little different with the Lord. You know, it's your time. It's your time with the beloved. So use it as your time. And be as creative there as you are with everything else that you do. You know, find different ways of expressing love for the mother or the father or the brother <laughs> divine or your child, however you're, <laughs> however you're going about your effort. So he starts, he says, there are several poor ways of practice that you should understand. Usually when you practice zazen, you become very idealistic. That is very true. We get very idealistic and uh, that is both wonderfully inspiring and can be tragically discouraging also. Because we, the more that we are uh, around Thakur Ma Swamiji, the disciples and these ideals, our expectations of ourselves rise. You know, we're around the ideal. And we start wanting to be that ideal, of course. And we get eager and we get impatient. And then maybe what he's calling greedy, we get ahead of ourselves because we get this idea that we're going somewhere. But that's the wrong zazen, that's wrong practice. We're not going somewhere. We're celebrating being somewhere. <laughs> we're celebrating where we are because we have everything necessary in this very moment for our realization. Nothing has to be gathered. We don't have to run out and get a grocery list, you know, and collect a skull and a frog on a full moon night and whatnot. That's not where we're at at this point. Maybe somebody might be, but <laughs> in general, we're not looking for frogs and skulls at this point to accomplish something. We're sitting in, we're sitting in the presence of pure love, and so it's a celebration of that, and it's, uh, it's, it's an enjoyment of that, not in a sentimentality, you know, but in a serious understanding of, of our ideal based on what we are and who we know. So usually when we practice zazen, we become very idealistic, and you set up an ideal or a goal which you strive to attain and fulfill. But as I have often said, this is absurd. <laughs> when you are idealistic, you have some gaining idea within yourself. By the time you attain your ideal or goal, your gaining idea will create another ideal. So as long as your practice is based on a gaining idea, all right, as long as you think you're going to get something or you're going to some imaginary day of perfection in the future, or you're building some, Amer some imaginary castle of an idealistic self, whatever you're, if you have any gaining idea in your practice and you practice Zazen in an idealistic way, you will have no time to actually, you'll have no time actually to attain your ideal. <laughs> it, because our ideal isn't some place that we're going or something that we're going to get. It's what you are. It's who you are. And your time in practice is not to gain that, but to know that. And you get to know somebody by how? By spending time with them, by hanging out in that company. And so that's what's happening in our practice. It's our holiest of company. 
It's sitting in that divine silence within and not thinking about it, not cognating about it, not analyzing it, just soaking in it like a rascola in syrup. You know, just letting, letting the idea of God, of unconditioned love, of immortality, of infinite strength, infinite hope, all the qualities of love, letting all of them really soak in to this sponge of the, of the soul and, and inundate our thinking and our being and, and return, you know, in a sense, return through renunciation, not acquisition, but through renunciation to return to our divine nature. Moreover, you will be sacrificing the meat of your practice. Yes, if you're sitting there waiting or trying to get somewhere or to make something happen, you're missing what's happening. Right? Sri Nishragadatta says that wonderful statement. He says, do you not realize it is your quest for happiness itself that prevents you from being happy? <laughs> Why is that? How is that true? Well, it's because for you to decide to go on a quest to be happy, it means you have to decide you're not happy. Where are you going to get your happiness from if it's not from your own self? So in the same way, if you, if you, if you head off in your practice to see God, that might sound like a great thing. You know, you could certainly talk about that in a very logical way. But your first assumption is wrong, that you need to find God, that God is somewhere else or God is not present, which is not true. God is everywhere present and always perfect. You don't have to go get him or her or that. You have to just be with that and learn to see. And so you sit there and you look at your old dresser sitting in your room and you wonder how, how is it that that could be God? And yet, you know, Ramakrishna showed Swami Vivekananda that a teacup is God, even though at one time uh, Vivekananda laughed and made fun of him over that idea. This teacup is God, is it? And then you have Vivekananda walking down the streets in Calcutta, banging his head on iron gates to make sure they're real. <laughs> so, <laughs> all these things. So moreover, you will be sacrificing the meat of your practice because your attainment is always in front of you or always ahead. You will always be sacrificing yourself now for some ideal in the future. And what's the problem with that? There's no such thing as the future. The future is an idea, it's a concept, and it'll hold whatever you want to put in there, but whatever you put in there, you're not going to get back, because <laughs> there's no there there. There's no future. This is about now. And he says you end up with nothing. Very true. If you're striving for something, if you're striving for a good meditation, you're not going to get a good meditation. Right. That's something I really tripped out, tripped. I tripped out on it <laughs> using very technical Sanskrit words. I tripped out on this uh, idea early on in my practice when, <laughs> you know, the, this idea of striving to attain. Because one day I was in the shrine and I had a nice I was having a nice meditation. I think I shared this and I kind of, I, those words went through my head. I'm having a nice meditation. And as soon as I became aware of an eye that was having a nice meditation, I became nervous about maintaining it. Suddenly that blissful meditation was disturbed. And so the next few days when I would go in to sit, I would go in search of that good meditation that I had been having. And as long as I did that, I couldn't find it. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't find it. And, uh, you know, it's because of this notion, everything that we learn, we always objectify it first. Because you can't get something into your mind unless you objectify it. Unless you make it an object of sense that you can put in front of you and study its differences and then put it in your mind and draw lines of relationship from it to everything else in your mind. But when you objectify something, it's no longer yours. It's external, it's separate from you. And so if you look at a good meditation as something to have, to go and get, you've objectified it. 
And as long as it remains objectified, you can't be it, which is what a good meditation is. A good meditation is being one with one, being one with the beloved at all of our different levels. You know, I'm not talking about merging every time you sit down for meditation, although please do that if you can. But uh, we're talking about sitting in the presence of God to whatever level that is. It might be just a good chuckle every now and then as you think about the oddity of what you're doing. It might be the reflection of a thought that occurs to your mind. But anything that you think or do in a meditation is done in the company of God. You're not doing it outside of God. And that's what makes the time special. That's what makes the time beautiful because it's a time where you're practicing what you always want to be. That's why we call it practice. So you're practicing what you always want to be. And what you always want to be, well, according to our aphorisms from Brother Lawrence, you want to be in the presence of God, always. You want divine love. You want an endless supply coming at you, and you want an endless supply leaving you. <laughs> That's the ideal human being. That's the ideal life. And so we sit with that idea. We sit in the love of God and we enjoy it to whatever, whatever amount that we can. In the beginning, it's a lot of imagination, a lot of remembering scriptures and stories and running them through your mind, a lot of trying to get that image of your ideal to stick in your mind for a moment, you know, and then one day something happens and that picture is no longer just this weird picture in your mind but it's almost like a living presence for a second and then you you're like wait wait where did you go what happened <laughs> you know mother gave you that split second of grace and you spend the next 10 years running to look for her that's the danger you know that's the danger so when you sit you sit in faith that god is and that you're in that presence and you do away with all of the separating exercises of the ego by reminding yourself of grace, by reminding yourself that you have all that you have and are all that you are, because mother has already given it to you. You have your Satchit Ananda. <laughs> you better anyway. <laughs> Moreover, you'll be sacrificing the meat of your practice because your attainment is always ahead. You will always be sacrificing yourself now for some ideal in the future, and you end up with nothing. This is absurd. It is not adequate practice at all. But even worse than this idealistic attitude is to practice Zazen in competition with someone else. All right. I won't pretend that I don't hear those conversations sometimes in the kitchens of our centers. You know, <laughs> I won't pretend. There is sometimes a competition between, between us as devotees about being de better devotees. Or, God forbid, competitions between swamis wanting to be better swamis. You know, whatever it is, it's part of the ego nature that we have to be aware of. Because that awareness alone will, will correct it, will, will teach us the, <laughs> the absurdity. It becomes something you get to laugh about when you start to see that in yourself. When you start to recognize your competition, you know, I had an imaginary person I was always competing with, you know, this whoever I, I, the, I can remember, especially in my younger days, I can't lie, the thought is still there in my mind, you know, where I would go into the temple during the day and there'd be nobody in there, right, just be me. And I'd be sitting there doing my practice and the door would open. And I have to tell you, there was a part of me that was just so happy that someone came in to see that I was meditating. <laughs> <laughs> that I was sitting in the shrine, you know, and, you know, this, this is our condition, you know, it really is that desperate, it really is that sad, and the wonder of it is, is that you can sit there and, and, and be aware of it, you don't have to be ashamed of it, you don't have to feel down about it, you don't have to be disappointed in yourself about it, why all of that, that's just more nonsense in the mind, what you do is you look at mother and you just third party it. You're like, oh, there he goes again, mother. Can you believe it? How are you going to get that guy to realization? <laughs> how are you How are you going to get that bozo? How are you going to do that? I can't wait to see it. But anyway, I'll sit here, you know, because you separate. You're not the problem. 
The problem is mind and body and confusion and ignorance. You're none of those things. So sit there freely with the mother and laugh about the chump, the ego. Laugh about that idiot, you know, that can't sit pra and do practice for 10 minutes without self-aggrandizing his effort or her effort, you know, or start wanting more. You know, be free with your mother. Be free with the beloved. Be free with that ideal inside. And when you see the shortness, the, 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 the lack, when you see yourself making these mistakes, see them. Be serious about seeing them. Look at them straight in the eye, but don't be afraid and don't own them as your own. Just see them and they will flee. They'll flee because your attention is divine attention and divine attention is always self-correcting. It will always bring us closer to the divine. So he's saying, so he's saying here, so, but even worse than this idealistic attitude is to practice Zazen with the competition with someone else. This is a poor, shabby kind of practice. <laughs> All right. We don't want a poor, shabby practice. Now, we certainly don't want to have mother ever look at us and say, what a poor, shabby practice. <laughs> so don't do it. You're not in competition with anyone. You are there to help everyone, not to compete with them. You're there to inspire them and encourage them and, you know, notice them sitting in the shrine, <laughs> commenting, encouraging them, saying, oh, that was so wonderfully inspiring to open the door and see you sitting in the shrine, you know. What were you reading on your phone anyway? <laughs> so our Soto way puts an emphasis on shikantaza or just sitting, just being, nothing accomplished, nothing doing, nothing analyzing, nothing cognating, nothing fixing, just sitting. Actually, we do not have any particular name for our practice. When we practice Zazen, we just practice it. And whether we find joy in our practice or not, we just do it. Even though we are sleepy and we are tired of practicing zazen, of repeating the same thing day after day, even so, we continue our practice. Whether or not someone encourages our practice, we just do it. Now that's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way of doing practice. Just do it. Don't make every practice a decision. You know, when you get up in the morning, just know, you know, I don't have any option. There's no options. There's no need to decide to sit and do my practice. I just do it. And I sit there with the beloved and I'm just sitting there with the beloved. If something arises, we watch it arise together. Once it crashes and settles back into the sea, we let it settle back into the sea. But we do it just in the comfort and presence of the divine. No matter what the mood, you know, because God is everywhere. He's even in that bad mood. And by, by separating yourself from that bad mood and looking at it and having a conversation about that chump with the bad mood with your beloved sitting next to you, that can turn into a wonderful time, a wonderful experience of God and a great learning moment as you see that, that a bad mood cannot be maintained without your identifying with it. That if you can separate it from it, talk about it to the Divine Mother and laugh at the chump who's got a bad mood, that bad mood will go away. That's the divine awareness. That is the divinity in you. And it's self-repairing. It will clean up the mess itself because you're in the company of your mother. And if you've got a dirty diaper on, your mother changes it. <laughs> That's how it is. <laughs> or your father these days, thank goodness, you know. You have the cho these the you have someone who is going to bring you home, who's going to get you together, and all you have to do is spend time with them. We just do it, even when you practice zazen alone without a teacher. I think you will find some way to tell whether your practice is adequate or not. When you are tired of sitting and when you are disgusted with your practice. 
You should recognize this as a warning signal. You have been discouraged. You have become discouraged with your practice when your practice has been idealistic. You have some gaining idea in your practice, and it is not pure enough. It is when your practice is rather greedy that you become discouraged with it. So you should be grateful that you, ha that you have a sign or a warning signal to show you the weak point in your practice. So what is that warning signal? He says that warning signal is when you're tired of sitting or when you're disgusted with your practice. You know, when you're not enjoying your practice anymore, that's a warning signal. It's not that practice is not enjoyable. It's that you've forgotten what is enjoyable about your practice. Sitting with, sitting with your best, best friend is always enjoyable, you know? So I, I like this idea of courting God. You're courting God because you, you want to marry him, her, that. You want to be lost in that union. And so how do you do that? You don't start planning the wedding and start getting all the details together and start writing up all of your invitations. No, that's not how that's done. You spend time together. <laughs> You go on dates together, you go out to dinner together, you take hikes together, you sit together, you sing together. This is how you know God. You know, you begin court, begin courting the beloved. And your practice is your courting. It's your date. Right? And it can be like that. You can change it up. This is probably a oovy groovy thinking for some, but you know, you can <laughs> you can do different things in your practice. You know, if it's not working or you change it up, you know, if you're if you think you're getting too far out there, then talk to your guru <laughs> and get some ideas, you know, to rein it back in again. You know, we don't we don't necessarily want you running down the street in your bathing suit with flower petals because that's your time with God. Certainly a wonderful thing to try maybe once or twice, but it might be getting out there. It's time to call your guru. <laughs> But up until that point, be free, have fun. The love, the love of God, the, the presence of the beloved. Oh, what a divine party is going on. Read Hafiz. All of his laughing and joking and joyfulness in the presence of God, his dancing on the roof, his sitting in the bar and seeing the divine play happening all around him. You know, <laughs> the hilarious, the hilarious imagery that he comes up with about his time with God, about his time with the beloved. So this is Zazen, this is practice, not a gaining idea, not an earning idea, not a slogging idea, not an acquisition of something. It's the celebration of an isness that is deeply established within you that requires only your quiet surrender to the moment to enjoy it. Swami, so you should, yes. It's really funny to me how you um, how you uh, talk about this beautiful idea of dating God in the context of Zen. You know, I mean, how you put the Vedanta ideas into the Buddhist thoughts. Um, I don't. I just think it's really charming and um, how it inspires you to think about personal God, even though we're reading about an impersonal practice. I guess it was a comment. But I yeah. love it when you do that. I love it when you do that. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I can't help it, but I, I, I steal permission immediately from him because he has a chapter called God giving. He, you know, we went through, so it's his fault. You know, he brought up the divine presence. But, but you know, the divine presence and God, it's just, it's Oh, I don't want to say that, but it's it's a divine principle. You know, God God is the divine principle. It's it's not a personality, although we celebrate it as a personality because God, of course, has been kind enough to present herself as such to us and to give us that permission and ability. But even then, that that divine personality is is an imprinting of an absolute. You know, it's 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 an instance of an ideal. It's not the thing itself. Um, 
but it's no less real. You know, you can't sit in your Zen practice and keep God as a principle, which is what the non the non the non dual idea. <laughs> we can't talk about these things. There's no way to properly talk about them. Uh, but yes, the, the, that 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 divine presence being present in the moment. You see this moment. Call this moment whatever you want. Look, you can look around you. You can come up with a billion names for this moment. But this moment is the I am. It's God. It is that. It is that. Now take that moment in its absolute form. It's either empty or full. It doesn't matter because there's no one to describe it. It's just an absolute isness. And so, you know, for for, for us as bhaktas, and because our our ideal Sri Ramakrishna, or many many people's ideal anyway, has said. You know that this love of God, the personal God, is the fastest way the fastest way to know the divine, the fastest way to have realization in this day and age. And so it, even as we study all of these Gyanic teachings, these uh, we have to know that the ideal of, uh, of, of one without a second, the Gyani ideal of, of one without a second means God, God without a second. It doesn't mean there's no, there's you and no God. That's not what it means. It means that there's God without a second. And so the nature of that divine God, that divine love for the Buddhist inspires his, his compassion, his love, his understanding. And why is that? Because that's the nature of isness. That's the nature of nirvana, you know, is nirvana of the void? Quite possibly. Is nirvana the fullness? Quite possibly. It ain't going to matter because there ain't going to be anybody standing there looking at it to tell you. It's one without a second. So yes, I do these things not, not, not on purpose even, but just because all of these teachers, all of these paths are going to the same place. And that same place is a singularity with no second. A singularity whose nature, the last, the last words you say as you're falling into the black hole of the divine, the last conscious words you'll say is, love, oh, wisdom, isness, oh my, done, you're finished, no more books from you, you know, and so that's what we celebrate, and that's what, that's what all practice is. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of emphasis. If you're doing a pure Buddhist practice, you know, where, the, where it's calmness of the mind and the absence of everything not divine, which is what a mindful mind is, a mind that's in the presence of God or is expressing the divine nature at all times, um, you can emphasize that, that approach of it. But the same person sitting next to you, looking at you through the eyes of Sri Ramakrishna or, or Jesus or any other, is, is going to see the divine presence, is going to celebrate that marvel. You know, when you're enlightened, people are going to celebrate that enlightenment by being around you, by wanting your company, by wanting to learn from you. You know, that's not because you managed to put nothing there. <laughs> It's because you've allowed something that is to manifest and it's doing a wonderful job of it. It's beautiful and it's inspiring. So yes, yeah. you know, it's your choice. See it as personal or impersonal as you like, but we're talking about the same thing and we're celebrating the same thing together. And so, you know, don't be offended if someone's very personal and don't be overawed if someone's very impersonal. You know, it's, we're 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 doing the same dance. We just got <laughs> we just got different shoes on. I don't know. Anyway, just practice it. He says, just practice it. So hours, you know, day after day, we just continue this practice, and uh, don't have a gaining idea. He says that's what causes us to have trouble, discouragement. 
uh, about our practice is when we're wanting more than we have, which is ridiculous because we have everything. Your assumptions are wrong when you feel like you need something external. So you have some gaining idea in your practice and it's not pure enough. It is when your practice is rather greedy that you become discouraged with it. So you should be grateful that you have a sign or a warning signal. At that time, forgetting all about your mistake and renewing your way, you can resume your original practice. This is a very important point. Yes, because see, you're getting this point here from a Gani, and we uh, tonight are studying the same point from a Bhakti. You know, at that time, if you if you have forgotten, if your mind has wandered, if you become unaware, if you've gained, a, if you've had a gaining idea, if you've gotten off center, what do you do? Forget all about your mistake. Renew your way. Get yourself, bring it back, put it on the track, and resume your original practice. Boom, done, done. You know, no need to write down in the margin of your diary, big failure on today. I now have three negative karma points in my Reddit account. You know, <laughs> not like that. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So you should only be aware of wrongs. You shouldn't record them. Just be aware of them. Look at them, separate from them, talk to your divine partner about them, laugh them off and get back to business. What is your business? Enjoying the presence of your beloved, enjoying the moment, enjoying being. There's a wonderful, I'm going to find that. I've, read, I've talked about this woman's video now for four days. I have to find it to share it with everybody. Young woman, very young woman, 20 something. I didn't take her video seriously when it started, which was my big mistake because she had a beautiful spiritual point to make. And she was talking about depression. And the, the way that she dealt with her with her suffering, and she was telling the interviewer, she said, you know, I had this idea once that before I came to this planet, before I became this person that I am, that I was sitting with God, and God turned to me and said, hey, do you want to go somewhere? And I said, where? And he says, do you want to go somewhere where you can experience the full spectrum of, of emotions and suffering? where you can do and be anything you want to do and be, and you can see anything you want to see as you want to see it. And she was like, yes, yes, I would love to experience that. And so she says, anytime that I'm here and I'm suffering and I'm in a terrible state of mind, I stop thinking about it being a terrible state of mind. And I just start being amazed that I can experience it, that I can be aware of it. And she said that that changes everything. When even in the moment, if there's sadness and suffering, instead of seeing it as sadness and suffering with a cause, look at how amazing it is that you can experience, that you can be aware, that you can feel, and how deeply you can feel. Be amazed and just embrace whatever life brings, because the moment is always 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 profound always inscrutable always with no limit always expansive you can take the simple things that are bothering and hemming your life into a little square in, in the world right now and any one of them just pick it up feel it again touch it for the first time again experience it for the first time again open to it. Let this life be in all of its amazement and all of its profundity and its inexplicable nature, the infinity that you keep running into. Anytime you pick up something small, if you look at it long enough and think about it deep enough, it becomes immeasurably huge. It becomes without limit. You know, Vivekananda said, you can pick up a grain of sand and spend the, your entire life probing the mysteries of that piece of sand. And he said, even if you live to be 100 years old, by the time you have finished with that piece of sand in this life, you will have more questions than you had on the first day that you picked it up. You would realize the more you look at that piece of sand, the less you're ever going to know about that piece of sand. You know? 
The world becomes infinite as you stare at it because its nature is born of infinity. It is God and God is hiding fractally in everything. You know, the macroverse is in the microverse or the microverse, <laughs> whatever wrong or whatever we can understand. But the, macro, the macrocosm is in the microcosm. God is everywhere present and can be fully seen, whether you take a big chunk of a mountain or you take a piece of dust off of the broom. God is fully present in both of them and can be fully experienced in both of them. Both of them will be infinite, simultaneously existent. It's unbelievable. We better get back to this. <laughs> so at that time, forget about your mistake, renew your way, and resume your original practice. This is very important. So as long as you continue your practice, you are quite safe. But as it is very difficult to continue, you must find some way to encourage yourself. As it is hard to encourage yourself without becoming involved in some poor kind of practice, to continue our pure practice by yourself may be rather difficult. This is why we have a teacher. With your teacher, you will correct your practice. Of course, you will have a very hard time with him, but even so, you will always be safe from wrong practice. So he's emphasizing the need for a guru, right? And that, that guru is necessary until, until you become aware of your inner guru, until you become aware of the presence, you know? But it's important to maintain that guru always because the mind is quite tricky. As you know, the more you study it, the more you watch it, the more you learn about its, its, its toddler nature, uh, the more you understand the need for having someone standing outside of you who can say, you know what, uh, your practice has become very gaining, gaining oriented. <laughs> You're becoming a little bit too type A about your spiritual life. It's important to have someone outside of yourself to teach you because if you don't, and you haven't, and you haven't done the the significant number amount of work to hear the guru inside. Then what happens? You become a you become a, a student of your own ego, and you begin to study things that you like, <laughs> and you begin to have a practice of just things that you like. You know, if there's no if there's no mitigating guru involved, um, you ultimately it becomes a practice of ego, and the ego is going to teach you how to be egotistical. He'll 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 hide it. <laughs> He'll, he'll dress it in spiritual clothing, but it'll be a pride of accomplishment. It'll be a counting of minutes that you meditate every day. It'll be wearing gold beads on your, on your mala. <laughs> so yes, the guru is very important. But in that, in that having a guru, it's very important for you also to develop the company, the constant companionship of your eternal guru your beloved, your highest ideal. And that's the most powerful teaching. That's the most powerful place. And they work in con consort with one another. You know, God manifests in your, in your external guru and manifests as your internal guru and will work through both of them to teach you being both of them. <laughs> what else can she do? Most Zen Buddhist priests have had a difficult time with their masters. Well, who hasn't? Uh, everybody, right? <laughs> Any of our teachers or bosses or, uh, you know, managers. <laughs> anybody with authority eventually has a problem. <laughs> so most Zen Buddhist priests have a difficult time with their masters. When they talk about the difficulties, you may think that without this kind of hardship, you cannot practice Zazen. But this is not true. Whether you have difficulties in your practice or not, as long as you continue it, you have pure practice in its true sense. Even when you are not aware of it, you have it. This is a wonderful little secret here. So it's not, it's it's your awareness of your perfect practice that needs to grow, not the de not the development of a perfect practice. See? It's an awareness of the presence of God that needs to grow. 
not the presence of God. These are the things to know in your practice. It's the, the, it's an awareness of your pure nature that purifies you, not you becoming pure. A very important thing that he's teaching us here, you know, and it is the role of grace to betray that to you, to, to allow you to let go of all the reasons that you shouldn't have what you're seeking, all the reasons that you, that God doesn't want to be with you, <laughs> all the horrible, horrible things that you are in the ego self. It is grace's, grace's role to let you lay that down for a moment and to assume the presence, to assume your perfection, to assume your purity, and to put it on like a coat, like a chudder of perfection that you borrow. There was a time when that was my practice, actually in San Francisco, when I first started in the monastery, because I was always ashamed to go into the shrine, because I knew, <laughs> oh my God, anytime I would start to sit there and try and do my practice, hell itself would go through my mind and I would be like, oh my God, you know, because I would sit there be totally engulfed in these wrong thoughts. And then after some amount of time, become aware of it. And then you're like, oh my God, <coughs> what am I, what, what have I been sitting here thinking about in the presence of my, oh my God, what a horrible thing, you know? And so I would be, I would be, you know, I told I told Greg actually at one point, he probably doesn't remember that, but that I didn't think that I should meditate in the shrine anymore until I had purified myself a bit more because I didn't want, you know, God to have to look at that tray of rotting vegetables in my mind. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that that tray of rotting vegetables was not me. It was not mine. And the, that struggle of mind was the struggle of mind. Mother, when she sits with me in the shrine, sees that realized self that is her beloved, that is her sweetheart. She, she is, is seeing God in you, perhaps to the same degree that you're seeing God in her. Well, and so to know that it's wonderful and to, to, to accept that is grace. Right? There's no way to accept that without grace. You can't accept this infinite mercy without an infinite surrender. That's the nature of it, you know. If you get a great big present for Christmas, you're going to have to lay down your eggnog so that you can carry it. <laughs> All right. What they talk about difficulties. You may think that without this kind of hardship, you cannot practice Zazen. This is not true. Whether you have difficulties in your practice or not, as long as you continue it, you have pure practice in its true sense. Even when you are not aware of it, you have it. So Dogen Zenji said, do not think you will necessarily be aware of your own enlightenment. Ooh, ooh, wonderful. Do not think that you will necessarily be aware of your own enlightenment. Whether or not you are aware of it, you have your own true enlightenment within your practice. This is marvelous. You know, it plays in line with that idea. It's like you are never going to be enlightened. Now, why would I say that? Because your enlightenment is your realization that there was no you. So who is the you that gets enlightened? Enlightenment is not an acquisition that's added to you. It's the subtraction of you from the equation, which allows you to be enlightened. So who is there to be aware of your perfection? You see, if you are aware of your own perfection, then you are egotistical, you're dual. You've separated yourself from the one to become aware of your own greatness. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> what a waste of time. You know, so in this, it's wonderful that he brings this point out. You, you, chances are you won't be aware of your own enlightenment because there's no you there to know it. <laughs> All right, whether or not you are aware of it, you have your own true enlightenment within your practice. Another mistake will be to practice for the sake of the joy that you find in it. Uh-huh. 
Actually, when your practice involved in, in a feeling of joy, it is not in very good shape either. All right, interesting. Of course, this is not poor practice, but compared to the true practice, it's not so good, <laughs> right? So it's moving from a lower truth to a higher truth. It's not that it's wrong. It's just that that's a burden. If you do your practice for enjoyment, that's a burden. That's a bondage. Because if that enjoyment's not there, you, you're not enjoying your practice. You're, 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 the reason for your practice is missing. I'm here to enjoy myself. You're here to take what comes in the presence of the divine. And if you can do that without judgment, without, without a, 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 an accounting of ego condition, it will always be joy. It will always be bliss. It will always be a wonder. But if you look at it through the ego self, if you have a reason that you sit, oh, I enjoy sitting. Oh, it calms me. Oh, it centers me. Then only as long as it remains functional in those aspects, Will you be satisfied in it? Do you see? That's a bondage. You're not free. And so always, always accept what is. Whether it's good, bad, deep, shallow, enjoyable, or painful, accept what is and see it as an amazing profundity. The evidence of an eternal awareness that you're touching. Of course, this is not poor practice, but compared to the true practice, it's not so good. In, Hinaya, in Hinayana Buddhism, practice is classified in four ways. All right, here's four ways. The best way, just to do it without having any joy in it, not even spiritual joy. This way is just to do it, forgetting your physical and mental feeling, forgetting all about yourself in your practice. Your absorption in God means you're absorbed in God. Where are you if you're absorbed in God? You know, so this is the notion. The best practice is a practice that has no value considerations at all. It is what it is. You're fully present in it. You're absorbed in it. There's no thought of, of me and mine. That's a, that's a great practice. That's, that's the highest practice. Forgetting all about yourself in your practice. This is the fourth stage or the highest stage. The next highest stage is to have just physical joy in your practice. At this stage, you find some pleasure in practice and you will practice because of the pleasure you find, oh, excuse me, you find in it. All right, so that's the second stage. That means it's not bad. Uh, you're, 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 <laughs> you're in the B category. That's not bad. You know, most of us start out in the F category. So if we're doing a B level practice, that's awesome. But know that there's there's a beautiful there's something more beautiful to be accepted that's going on simultaneously. So enjoy the physical practice, but know that that the forgetting of self is even higher. In the second stage, okay, the third one from the top, you have both mental and physical joy or a good feeling. These two middle stages are stages in which you practice sazen because you feel good in your practice. The first stage is when you have no thinking and no curiosity in your practice. You're just doing it. Oh, I got to sit. <laughs> oh, I got to do my practice. So you just sit there and do it. These four stages also apply to Mahayana practice. And the highest is just to practice it. So you see... We're going to have to finish next week on this one. But this idea of your practice, you know, it's not something to be measured. It's not something to, to, get, to give yourself a grade for, you know. It's just an acceptance of isness. For a moment, you're going to do and focus just on that. Why? To practice the way you want to be the rest of the day to practice the way you want to move through life. That's why it's practice. And so we establish that presence of God and we accept the grace necessary to open to it so that we can be changed merely by the thought of God's awareness and presence with us. 
for the presence in this moment, fully mindful of the moment. We'll try and take the Gani perspective for a second here, just to be fully absorbed in being. No opinions about being, no interpretation about being, no story to being, just being fully present in this moment alone, the unchanging, infinite, radical moment of isness, nirvana, the great void. <laughs> All right. Anybody have a, a question or something they want to add, comment on? Yeah. It was beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. That's great. Yeah. The, 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 the <laughs> things are always that way. God, it's just amazing. What a privilege it is we have. Sure. You know, sure. I spent 35, I spent 35 years of my life without any of these thoughts, mm -hmm. without any of this, without any of these ideas. I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. what, what it was it practical. Was. Mommy, it was yeah. very practical today. I always love that. Excellent. <laughs> what did you say? Just tell the mother, change my diaper. <laughs> Yeah, change the change that fool's diaper. <laughs> I'll watch or from here. Take a walk with your best friend. I love that mm -hmm. that whole mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, there was a I the first time I saw that in, in real, where I really saw that in someone. Um, I I, I uh, took a walk uh, with I think it was Sri Dharananda in 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 um, Mayavati. Every afternoon at four o'clock, he would take a walk. And so I noticed that and I asked him if I could join for the few days that I was staying there with him. He said, sure. And I would go walking with him. It was one of the reasons that I joined the monastery with those walks, because the way he talked about God, I could see that he walked with God. Up until that point in my life, anytime somebody talked about God, they always had a reference a scripture reference mm -hmm. you know in john 4 8 it says that oh you mm -hmm. know what i think about god is over in first corinthians 8 verse 2 and 3 every time anybody <laughs> talked about god it was a reference and i you know that's how you knew god to, to me at that time when i walked with sri darnanda the, that those days in my avati there were no references there were tears he would talk about god and would get so caught up in that conversation he would just pour his heart out and I would just mm. sit there in such a raptured hope that one day I would know that. What was his name? Could you say his spell it, his name? Sri Dharananda? Yeah, he's in Sydney, Australia now. Sri Dhar S R S R I D H A R A N A N D A. Sri Dharananda, I think. Is he the senior Swami, Swamiji? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. very senior. There's lots of his talks on YouTube, and every one of them, are, he's amazing. Uh, he used to come and give retreats in San Francisco for us uh, for at the at the Olima retreat. And I tell you, when he would speak, those walls would thunder, <laughs> both literally and figuratively. He he is such a powerful. He was he's in his now he's in his 90s, but even then he was in his late 80s. And the power with which he spoke and presented his ideas was amazing. And the other thing that I really liked about him is that he would recluse. You know, he would come and he would spend just a few moments after each talk with the devotees, but then he would go to his room and he would sit and practice almost the whole time that he wasn't speaking when he would come to do a retreat. And I always thought, God, that's the way to, that's really real. That's the way to do that. If you're not sitting with God or if you're not enjoying sitting with God, what is there to talk about? <laughs> what is there to say? You know. All right. Thank you. Yes, Thank indeed. you, Swami. Thank be you. Be well. Swami. We'll see whoever's there tonight. Whoever's right. not there, be well. And next Monday at 4 p.m. will be our first art class art and his art and spirit and you'll put the I, zoom link on the website swamiji yes it's going up okay. today right after this class goes up absolutely great thank uh, you and do you know what, what time is it 
What time is it? The class tonight. I'm so muddled with the time zones. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. I know. It's, it is a drag. Tonight at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. California Time, 9 p.m. Oh. Eastern Time. Do you know whether or not the centers are safe in California with all the flooding? Um, safe would be an overextension. Uh, I know that uh, the nuns were all right as of yesterday, although 101 was closed and there was no way up to the convent yeah. um, from down below. So, yeah. but they're in, they're, they're, their place is in a pretty safe, nobody can say safe because, you know, yeah. <laughs> the nature of things, but yeah. Um, yeah, they're 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 doing all right so far. Everybody that I've checked in with is safe and is has been evacuated actually um, to other places. They they evacuated all of Montecito, all the way down to the northern half of Carpentaria. So yes, okay. yeah. All right, Jaiman. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. Thank you.